Let's uh, turn over to Revelation chapter 1. Tonight we are looking at part 6 of the Son of Man vision. Revelation chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 9 through 20 if you'd like to follow along. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom of and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight, that you will reach our hearts, give us understanding, give us application, cause us to become more excited and zealous about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thus to live a life that is pleasing to him. Father, we commit this time to you, and pray that you will bless your word as it goes forth and by your spirit cause us to understand and to obey. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last time we were in Revelation was, of course, last week. And the last week we saw that the book of Joel in the Old Testament is one of the most important keys to understanding the transition from Israel's time clock to the church age in which we live. In the Old Testament, you know this well, I hope you know it well by now, in the Old Testament, the church is not in view. It's a mystery. But Joel gives us a critical prophecy that is the trigger that God used to open the door for the Gentiles to enter the promises of God without having to become Jews first. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to enter the promises of God, you had to convert to Judaism. And we see various individuals throughout the Old Testament doing that. We even see that up in the book of Acts when we get to the Ethiopian eunuch who had converted from being an Ethiopian to being a Jew religiously and he was going to the temple for the feast days and so on. If you wanted to get into the promises of God in the Old Testament, you had to convert to Judaism. But Joel gives to us two keys which help us to understand how God opened the door to the Gentiles to enter the promises of God without becoming Jews first. I can't stress that enough. The book of Joel is a key book. It gives us the key that unlocks what happens in the book of Acts. Joel speaks of the day of the Lord in chapter 1 and then develops the theme of the day of the Lord in chapter 2. Chapter 1, he introduced it. 
Remember, Joel 115, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The day of the Lord is a major theme of the book of Joel. But now note the passage in Joel 2 quoted by Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. But Peter only extracts two key ideas, and I'm going to discuss that, the Lord willing, in detail tonight because it's very important. A lot of people say, well, yeah, Peter said all that stuff out of Joel 2, but none of that other stuff happened, so therefore we can't take that prophecy literally. I hope that we're able to answer that question tonight because it is the key to answering a lot of the attacks on the future prophecies, both from the Old Testament and also from the book of Revelation. Remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. What we see here are two things. Number one, Peter begins with a quote from Joel 2 concerning the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He starts in the middle or closer to the end of chapter 2. He doesn't quote the whole chapter. He starts at verse 28 of Joel 2. And then he ends his quote with, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are the two things that he preaches about in Acts chapter 2. He merely quotes them in context because at that point it's still future. In other words, most of what Peter quotes did not happen on Pentecost. And so it therefore is still future. Now here's what Peter said. For these are not drunken, this is Acts 2, beginning in verse 15, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by Joel, the, by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord shall come. So we're still talking day of the Lord here. We've got it at the beginning. we got it near the end. But Peter only pulls out two things. And it shall come to pass, here's the second thing he pulls out to preach about, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he begins his sermon. And those are the two issues that Peter preaches in his sermon. He doesn't talk about the rest of the things. He doesn't talk about the sun turning to darkness. He doesn't talk about the moon turning to blood. He doesn't talk about vapors of smoke. He doesn't talk about signs in the heavens. He doesn't talk about blood and fire. He doesn't talk about wonders in the heavens. He talks about two things, the pouring out of the Spirit of God, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are the two elements out of that very brief passage from Joel 2 that Peter picks up on to preach. And that is essential for us to understand, as I hope you'll see in a minute, why the other prophecies are yet future and will indeed come to pass literally. Now, we've only touched briefly on this, but tonight I want to do a little more in-depth study. This is the key to our discussion of prophecy, especially in the book of Revelation, because Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It's a transition from national Israel to a new program that God is beginning in Acts 2 while putting the program concerning Israel on hold. Now, God didn't cancel his relationship with Israel because he gave eternal promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to the prophets, and to others in the Old Testament. And he calls them eternal promises. And he says, those promises will never be canceled out unless you can destroy all the stars and the sun and the moon too, which you can't do. He says, I still have those promises, but he puts them on hold beginning in Acts chapter 2, as we'll see in a minute. He temporarily stops the clock for national Israel while he opens the doors for others to come in. In our study of the book of Acts, we saw a 12-step expansion out from Jerusalem. I hope you, as you think through the book of Acts, you can think of these 12 different steps. This is essential to what's happening on the day of Pentecost, and it is essential to what will happen yet in the future. You remember it began, step number one, it began with Jewish males, that's Acts 2, in the courtyard of the men. 
and I hope we demonstrated thoroughly enough that it was only men in Acts chapter 2. Jewish males in the temple, in the courtyard of the men. God started there. We see Jewish males and females in Acts chapter 5. Certainly we see at least one female because she got killed. That's Ananias and Sapphira. Then we see it expanding out to widowed females in chapter 6, where the church is beginning to take care of the widows who are in their assembly. Then we see it expanding to the Samaritans, who are half Jewish and half Gentile. Plus, it mentions both men and women in Acts chapter 8. Then we see it expanding to a man who is a Gentile by birth, but a Jew by religion. That's Acts chapter 8 also, who is neither male nor female. So we've seen males, then we've seen females, and we've seen male and females together. Then we've seen a guy who is neither male nor female. That's the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Then we find the door open to a Jewish persecutor and killer. That's Acts 9. That's Saul. Then we see, much to the shock of many, the gospel is expanded to those who are 100% Gentiles and among the persecuting nation, the Romans. In Acts chapter 10, that's Cornelius in his household. Then we see in Acts chapter 16, the gospel is extended to biracial children of mixed marriages. That's Timothy with a Gentile father and a Jewish mother in Acts 16. Then we saw it expanded to those who were female heads of the home in Acts chapter 16 as well. That's Lydia and her household. Then we find it expanded to entire families, including Gentiles in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer. And then surprisingly, the very last group that we see the gospel reaching are Old Testament saints who were disciples of John, who did not know that the Messiah had come, had been crucified, had risen, that Pentecost had occurred and the Holy Spirit had been given, even though they then baptized with the baptism of John. And that's Acts chapter 19. And in the middle of all of this, we see the territorial expansion to the Gentile world outside of the land of Israel, from Acts 11 throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Now, all of the promises of the Old Testament concerning national Israel relate to the land. But in the book of Acts, we see the expansion moving from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. That goes beyond the Old Testament prophecies concerning the spread and the inclusion of others as well. Gentiles in the Old Testament, remember, had to become Jews. That meant they were obligated to keep the feast days. That meant the three times a year when the males were supposed to come to Jerusalem, they were obligated to make the trip no matter where they lived in the Gentile world. They were obligated to make the trip to Jerusalem <coughs> to fulfill the feast days. But that's no longer true for us today. Now, let me read you what Joel actually said, whom Peter is quoting. Joel is speaking in the context of national Israel when they are actually in the land. Now, they are today, but you know they were not for 2,000 years. Joel is speaking in the context of national Israel when they're actually in the land. And as you can see, Peter did not quote the entire chapter because he was focused on only those two key elements that happened at Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. But as we look at the Joel 2 passage, we have the day of the Lord explained over and over again, and it actually includes millennial blessings. The two triggers, the two triggers that are in Joel 2 that open the door for the Gentiles, so that 12-part expansion that we just listed are, who remembers? Number one is the, is anybody listening? Pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Number two, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's right. Very good. But listen to the context. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the Lamb tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. That's how it starts. You've got all kinds of things about darkness and gloominess, uh, thick clouds, thick darkness. Uh, you find uh, great people invading the land. You find fire devouring. You find flame burning. You find the land had been a garden of Eden and then it's scorched. We find chariots on the mountaintops. We find battle. We find rubble. We find 
uh, battle array. We find mighty men running. We find them climbing the war. Did any of that stuff happen on the day of Pentecost? No. You see them marching all over the land, one way and the other. We see uh, they're walking their path. They fall upon the sword. They shall not be wounded. They run to and from the city. They run upon the wall. And so we find great weeping. We find mourning. We find tearing the hearts and not the garments. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing passage as you read it. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. It's not happening on the day of Pentecost. We find all kinds of things. Let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare the people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. All kinds of things that didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. You can read all the way through the passage. We'll not read it all, but I'm just picking out a few of the, the things that are sta standing out. Some promises that God is giving in Joel chapter 2 concerning destruction. And then concerning blessing. We don't see these things happening. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. The floors shall be full of wheat, the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore unto you the years that the locust have eaten, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, the palm worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty, you shall be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God. He hath dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. The people shall never be ashamed. So we move from this incredible onslaught against Israel to millennial blessings. And all of that precedes what we see in Joel 2.28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters. I'm quoting for Joel now. I'm not quoting Peter's sermon in Acts 2. This is Joel beginning at 2.28. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I hope you saw it, that it's only verses 28 through 32 out of that entire chapter that Peter is quoting in Acts chapter 2. He begins with verse 28, which prophesies the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He ends with a verse dealing with the salvation by calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. That's verse 32. Those are the two verses that Peter pulls out of the text, and he preaches on those two verses. You know, there are many other things in the text. You probably noticed that as I was just reading that short passage of five verses there. There are many other things in the text that are also literally true. Like, for example... We find the remnant principle at the end of verse 32. It says, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That is a huge doctrine in the Old Testament. But Peter doesn't preach on it, even though it's here in verse 32. Because he's only picking out two things to preach on. Verse 32 also, it's tied to election and the sovereign call of God. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. But Peter's not preaching on election in Acts chapter 2. He's not preaching on the sovereignty of God or on the irresistible call of God. Peter doesn't preach on those truths, and you'll see why I'm saying this. Peter doesn't preach on those truths, but it doesn't make them any less true. In the same way, the future events of these verses are also true, even though Peter doesn't preach on them here. Just because he jumps over those verses in the middle and the critics say, well, you know, therefore, those things are not going to come to pass because they did not happen on the day of Pentecost. Well, Peter also doesn't preach on election on the day of Pentecost. Peter also doesn't preach on the remnant principle on the day of Pentecost. He's preaching on two things, but that does not nullify the rest of the passage. You need to understand that because you're going to, get, you're going to find somebody who's going to attack your beliefs by saying, look, these things didn't happen, so they're never going to happen. No, we have a trigger going on here, two triggers that are going on, because God is about to reveal a mystery that he'd never revealed before in the Old Testament. That's a very important 
principle for us to understand. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. Here are things that are still true, but Peter doesn't preach on them. I'll show wonders in the heaven and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Those things are mentioned in the book of Revelation as yet future. You can't deny them just because Peter chose to choose, by the Holy Spirit, chose to preach on two things out of that passage. Now, you all know that I often do that same kind of a thing. I read an entire passage or multiple passages, usually, to prove a specific point. But I don't preach on everything that's in the mess on that passage in that message. I focus on one or a few specific truths that I'm trying to demonstrate from the text. But just because I don't expound on all of the points in the supporting passages does not mean that I don't think that they are true. The same is the case with Peter in Acts chapter 2. Only two things happened on the day of Pentecost from the Joel 2 passage because those were the triggers that God used to open the mystery of the church with that 12-part expansion that I just listed. The rest of Joel 2 is literally true also, but fulfillment must wait until the church age is over and God returns to Israel's time clock. In fact, if you go on in the book of Joel, Joel 3 continues the prophecy about the day of the Lord, and that's also still clearly future. I'm not going to read it to you all the way through, but I mean, just a couple of verses. A multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. Joel said that in Joel chapter 2. When it occurs twice or three times or four times, and it occurs many, many times in the Old Testament, you know that God means what he's going to say. He's not stuttering. going to happen. Because those are the things that are restated in the book of Revelation. Now, last week I also read to you passages giving a huge amount of detail about the day of the Lord from Amos 5, Obadiah 1, Zephaniah 1 and 2, Zechariah 14, and Malachi 4, which is the prophetic key, just like Joel 2 is the prophetic key to the church. Malachi 4 is the prophetic key to the coming of John the Baptist. But it also deals with a future prophetic event. It foretells, and we'll see this when we get farther into the book of Revelation, Malachi 4 deals with two things. When Jesus talks about it as referring to John the Baptist, he is not denying the future fulfillments with Moses and Elijah in the book of Revelation. Just like John, uh, Peter is not denying the future fulfillment of the prophetic passages which are yet future for the book of Revelation. He's picking out two things that are triggers. The same thing when Jesus quotes Malachi chapter 4 in relation to John the Baptist, he's not denying the future fulfillment of the rest of that chapter, which is fulfilled, as we'll see in the book of Revelation. He is picking out one specific thing to point out how John is the forerunner of his first coming. If we could only understand that, just because Jesus pulls one part of the prophecy does not mean that the rest is not literal and true, just like we've seen concerning the day of Pentecost and the future day of the Lord. My point is, as you can see, the day of the Lord, that is the day of Jehovah, because it's all capitals, L-O-R-D, is clearly anticipated and described in the Old Testament in massive detail. If you say that's not going to happen, you must throw away major sections of almost every Old Testament prophetic book. Because they all give us details about the day of the Lord, which have not yet literally been fulfilled. Therefore, either they are not true or they are future. Those are your only two options. That's why this is so important as we start our study of the book of Revelation. We do not have to allegorize it. We do not have to mythologize it. We do not have to explain it away. These are things that will yet happen because God has spent pages and pages and chapters and chapters of the Bible talking about these future events. Now, we've only looked at a few of these in detail in our brief overview, but that does not mean that the rest of the details, which we have not examined, are not literal or true. So in summary, what's our takeaway from that brief study of the day of the Lord and its introduction here in the book of Revelation? Obviously, the day of the Lord is a major theme in prophecy. 
and it covers more than one 24-hour period of time, which the people who think that that means Sunday are saying that, can that only covers a 24-hour period of time. As we've seen just briefly scanning a few Old Testament passages, some of those passages deal with the tribulation. <clears throat> some of those passages deal with the second coming. Some of those passages deal with the millennial reign of Christ, but all of them are speaking about the period of time called the day of the Lord. That period, in summary, here's our takeaway, that period is characterized by judgment on the world, the wrath of God, war, destruction, natural disasters, signs and wonders, the rape of Israel, ascendancy of the Antichrist and his destruction, the battle of Armageddon, the judgment of the nations, and by the way, specific nations are mentioned in the Old Testament as to exactly what those nations are going to do. And they have not yet done those things, but it's not sort of some vague nation will do some sort of thing that will not be beneficial to Israel. There's none of that kind of nonsense. Very specific nations are listed, specific actions that those nations will perform, and in relation to other specific nations, are mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and we see them doing it in the book of Revelation. It is still future, it is still yet to come. <clears throat> we see that the second coming of Christ in power is mentioned, the millennium, the binding of Satan before his release, and the second and final battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium. That's a huge amount of territory to cover, but that is precisely what is covered in the book of Revelation. So I hope you can see the importance of identifying what John is saying in Revelation 1.10 when he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. The Lordian day, we pointed out there's an adjectival phrase here, or the Lordish day in the Greek text is not Sunday, for Sunday is never referred to in this way in the New Testament. What we're dealing with here at the very beginning of the book, it gives us the theme of the book. What we're dealing with can only be the great and terrible day of the Lord because that is the overwhelming theme of all of the book of Revelation after the letters to the seven churches. Now, some of you may think that I'm belaboring <clears throat> the point, but if you don't get it right from the beginning, you won't see how the rest of Revelation ties in with all the rest of the Old Testament passages dealing with the day of the Lord, proving that all of those Old Testament passages about the day of the Lord are still future and they are still literal and they are still true. It's important to note also that Peter speaks about the day of the Lord in the context of one day being like a thousand years and a thousand years being as a day. Now that's a very long time. And none of us here are gonna live a thousand years. Even back in the days of Methuselah, Methuselah didn't quite make it. He was 31 years short. He died when he was 969 years old. Somebody might have thought, boy, if he could have just eaten better or done something, you know, exercised more, maybe he'd have made it to a thousand. No. <laughs> but he did live 969 years. But a thousand years is not an open-ended guessing, date-guessing mechanism. It has nothing to do with God using long ages in the creation of the world. Now, this is very important because that's how theistic evolutionists try to use the passage. When Peter talks about a day as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, he's not talking about creation. He's not talking about the beginning of history. He's talking about the other end of history, the end of history. You can't confuse the two. Peter is talking about consummation. Peter is not talking about creation. So don't let anybody use sloppy exegesis on you on this passage to try to convince you of theistic evolution or threshold creationism, or framework theory, or some other compromised position. Peter's talking about the end, not the beginning. 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store. That's future. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, we've seen some atomic explosions on earth, but it hasn't consumed the earth yet, has it? I mean, we've got a, a crazy guy over in North Korea who's lobbing missiles up into the air to prove that he's cool. And uh, he's proved that he has uh, nuclear power. He blew up the side of a mountain and probably killed all the scientists that were inside it. But, uh, and he just shot a, a rocket that uh, he says can reach all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, but 
we haven't seen the earth consumed with fire and it's not going to be North Korea that does it. It's going to be God that does it. And at a specific time, God has reserved it under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, here's the context. This is the context for our verse. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, he's not talking about creation. What's he talking about? Consummation. He's talking about the end, not the beginning. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, still talking about future events, not creation, will come as a thief in the night. That's not a description of the six days of creation in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. No, God was creating the heavens and the earth with creation. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I hope you see how important this idea is because that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Now, let's talk about another term because sometimes people confuse this. <clears throat> Another phrase that's found in the New Testament is the last days. That covers a period of time before the day of the Lord. The last days covers a period of time before the day of the Lord. That phrase, the last days, is a reference to the church in the New Testament in one specific way. It relates to the rotting character of the church and the decadence of the world prior to the rapture. The last days are what we see happening as the church compromises with the world and loses its testimony and begins to rot from the inside and decay so that you can't tell the difference between Christians and non-Christians because they all look alike, they all sound alike, they all dress alike, they all listen to the same music, and nobody stands out from the crowd and says, Enough! God says this! The last days refers to that. Now, <clears throat> let me give some examples of this. First, let's go back to that tra transitional reference that we talked to about a minute ago because this is what introduces us to that new phrase, the last days. We find that phrase in Acts chapter 2. Just as Peter is talking about and quoting from Joel chapter 2, it's a trigger that comes out of Joel chapter 2. Listen to this. Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, there's our phrase, the last days, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Interesting, we find the first occurrence of that in exactly the same transitional passage where we're moving from God's time clock for Israel to God's mystery of the New Testament church in which we have that 12-stage progression where the gospel reaches out to all the world and people don't have to become Jews first before entering into the promises of God. It's in the same passage in Joel 2, and it's part of that pouring out of the Holy Spirit what's going to happen. And we see the phrase, in the last days. Let me show you one other passage that's also written primarily to Jews, which occurs just before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We find that same uh, phrase, the last days, and it gives us the same insights that we gain from studying Peter's use of Joel in Acts chapter 2. This is from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews, you know, was written to the Jews at Jerusalem just before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And they're warned not to go back to the old ways. We have the five better things of the book of Hebrews. Don't go back to the old sacrifices. Don't go back to the old priesthood. You've got better things now because all those things are going to go away. Hang on to the new things that you have. And we find the phrase, the last days. God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the 
uh, prophets in time past by the fathers hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now that's interesting, because Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 mentions the last days which relate to the church, and he also mentions creation. But he doesn't talk about the judgments of God. He talks about what will happen if the church compromises. A major theme as we go through the book of Hebrews. If the church gives up on its faith, if the church decides to sort of try to blend in with the world around it so they don't cause too many waves and don't get persecuted. That's the way Hebrews chapter 1 is introduced. Now let's look at how the phrase the last day is used in the rest of the New Testament. And as you'll see, it refers to the rot and the corruption that will occur as the church fails in the commission that Christ gave to us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. As the church gives up on its mission and instead decides to blend in with the world and sort of compromise with the world, hoping that the world will sort of come into the churches that way. We talked about separation this morning, how God's called us to be a separated people, even when there's only a handful like Gideon's band. The arm of God is not shortened that he can save by many or by few. He can save if he wants to by one, as with Samson who slew a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. Listen to this out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. The rot and corruption that will occur as the church fails in the commission that Christ gave us. Paul gives an entire chapter describing the character of the last days through which the church will fade into irrelevancy for the most part. It's clearly not the same as the description of the day of the Lord. The last days as described here in 2 Timothy 3 does not have all those elements that we've just seen out of all those Old Testament passages and out of the book of Revelation. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, we talked about that on Thanksgiving, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, oh, they look so good on the outside, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. So warning, women, if you act like that, an apostate will take advantage of you. Now, did you see anything there about blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the moon turning to darkness and all of that kind of stuff that was related to the day of the Lord? No. You see character qualities. And Paul is writing to Timothy, a young church planting pastor, and telling him what's going to happen in the church. And he describes this as the last days ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres, that's the names of the two mu uh, musicians, the two magicians, the two magicians that withstood Moses in Pharaoh's court. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifested unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, 
afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There is a difference between persecution and tribulation. Persecution is what the world does to Christians. Tribulation is what God sends on the ungodly, what we find in the day of the Lord and in the book of Revelation. Don't confuse those two things. Yes, we're going to go through persecution. But we're not going to go through the tribulation because, Paul tells the Thessalonians, God hath not appointed us unto wrath. God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but God has appointed us to salvation. God delivers us both from persecution by the world, either through death or through strength to go through it, but he's going to deliver us from the tribulation by the rapture. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But, now remember what was the theme here? He's talking about, know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And here's a description of what's going on in the last days. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is what's coming into the church. Paul's warning Timothy. He's telling you what society is going to be like, how it's going to rot around him. It's going to rot out from underneath him. If he does not have his, his hands firmly fixed on heaven, the ground falls out underneath. You cannot go that way or you will be destroyed by rot and corruption. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But, here's how you counter it. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, <clears throat> and that from a child, you all know these two verses, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What's he been talking about? In the last days, the church is going to rot. The way you avoid that is you hang on to the word of God. Because it's profitable to you for four things. It's profitable for doctrine, straight teaching. It's profitable for reproof. When you sin, it will speak out and it will tell you you're wrong. It's profitable for correction. It doesn't just say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It says, here's how to make it right. And then for instruction in righteousness. Instruction teaches you how to take the next step, how to take the next step, how to grow in faith, how to grow in Christ, how to walk in the Spirit, how to walk by faith, how to keep your eyes focused up, always looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. James describes the same thing concerning that phrase, the last days. He talks about the rot and the corruption and the focus on material things. Listen to James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten. You know, if you focus on that stuff, if that's your goal in life, to get as much gold and silver, fancy clothes, all kinds of decorations that you put on your body, all kinds of cool things that make you really look good and you move with the, the swingers out there, your gold and silver is cankered. That is, it has cancer. And the rest of them shall be witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together. Now listen to the phrase. For the last days. When Christians focus, James is writing to Christians. In this point, he happens to be writing to rich Christians. In other words, James is writing to American Christians. Folks, we are rich by the standards of the rest of the world. There are people who work for less than a dollar a day, and they have almost nothing. You and I are rich, but what are we doing with it? 
Are we heaping it up? That's what he says. You've heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you is kept back by fraud? You say, well, we can't afford it. You know, we're not going to pay him much. We're not going to give him a raise, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The Lord of Sabaoth means the Lord of armies. That's not the Lord of Sabbath. It's not that it was spelled wrong or, you know, the King James guys, you know, spelt Sabbath a funny way. This is, has nothing to do with Sabbath. Sabaoth is the word for armies. The Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. He's writing to Christians. He's telling about the character of the church in the last days. As we heap together riches. You've condemned and killed the just. He doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. There are those in the church who are experiencing what other believers were doing to them. A rather sad, ugly picture. But he says, keep hanging in there unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Lord is coming for his church. We don't find anything about blood and smoke and fire, and the sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood. We don't find anything about the armies invading Israel and the ravaging of the city of Jerusalem. You see, the day of the Lord is not the same thing as the phrase he uses here, the last days. The last days relates to the corruption inside the church as we lose our testimony before the world. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The day of the Lord, the last days. We don't have time for it tonight. We'll have to put this off till next week. But we see Peter uses both of those phrases. He uses the phrase, the last days, and he uses the phrase, the day of the Lord, and he demonstrates that the last days precede the day of the Lord. They are not contempor uh, contemporaneous. The, day, uh, the last days precede the day of the Lord. But we're going to have to pick that up next week. And that's what brings us into the major sections of the book of Revelation. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power and for your word and for the great and precious promises that you have given to us. As we look at the church today, not just this church, but the church at large, the church all across America, the church around the world, we see that the things of earth have pulled our attention aside. We focused on material stuff. We focused on heaping together treasures. And you give them cancer, you make them rot. Because suddenly we have a different God. We're committing idolatry. You've told us in Colossians 3.5 and in Ephesians 5.5 5, that covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. Oh, Father, help us to repent. The things we have do not belong to us. They belong to you. We are only stewards of resources that you have put into our hands like you have put resources into the hands of no other generations of, of Christians in all of world history. 
and you've given us a commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You've given us a commission to make our time on earth count for eternity and not merely for the temporal junk that we can collect. Father, we pray that you will make us wise stewards who eagerly look for our Lord's return. Wise husbandmen, as James describes us. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Help us, Father, to be patient, to establish our hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 750.